Out of the Ordinary Insights, brought to you by Investec Specialist Bank. We haven't even had a chance in the first half to talk about small telecoms. We will get to it uh, later on. And one of the reasons we haven't been able to get to it is because of your chequered career, starting as a union leader and then going to Johnny Communications and then to uh, MTN. The circumstances of your departure from MTN. If you go to the internet, it says here, uh, where does it say, uh, that you left MTN under controversial uh, conditions and you would be worth, it says, 150 million US dollars. So you're a billionaire, a rand billionaire. According to the article, but I once said, if anybody can find that one and a half billion rand or even a billion rand, I'll give them half. Okay. That's my answer. When somebody said to me, Irene, you, you are worth one and a half, one, 150 billion. So Lindsay, if you or anybody can find a billion rand in my account, you can have half of that. So what did you leave with? Or is that too personal a question? That, in fact, in terms of the, I, uh, in t when it comes to MTN, mm. I think it's the public knowledge that we did a scheme where mm. we bought in to the company. We even paid some of the executive directors, paid some of their own money as part of the funding for the scheme. We made 3,200 people very wealthy, ordinary MTN staff. Yeah. We made a number of millionaires. We also made money, but I can assure you, it is far from that number. Well, this same article actually says 32,000 disadvantaged South Africans. You say 3,200, so it sh shows the inaccuracy of the internet sometimes. Just the, the 32,000 mm. relates to Jonic. Okay. When, we, when I was at Jonic, we did an empowerment scheme for the public, and 32,000 people, no ordinary people within the public participated in a scheme a empowerment scheme where over five years they earned 400 percent return on their initial investment so that's what the 32,000 referred to and then when we did the management buy-in into Johnic through the through the uh, new shelf or Alpine Trust 3,200 staff members of MTN benefited a great deal and we created many many millionaires through that scheme Again, I was instrumental in that. So why, why did you leave MTN? To start my own business. I left MTN in 2007. Mm. Um, to be exact, there was an announcement in March 2007 uh, announcing that I am going to go on to my own business, I'm starting my own business, and that I will join the MTN board within a year's time. And that was a public in, in the, uh, uh, announcement they also acknowledge the, all the work and the impact that I've had in MTN and in taking them into Africa as well as into the Middle East. Some cynics might say, when you mention the Middle East, that one of the reasons you left MTN was because of the a little bit of uh, con controversy around uh, Iran. Can you tell us about the Iran Gate affair? Yeah, let's, let's uh, talk about Iran. In mm. fact, I always, when I hear about it, I want to laugh because the Iran issue came up in 2012. In yeah. fact, where are we now? We are in 2013, in, nine, in 20, in fact, the beginning of this year. Yes. That's the issue. That is when it actually emerged. Because that is when a, um, so that is almost five years, five and a half years after I've left MTN. So just in terms of progression. That's the way things work, though, of yes, course. People exactly. do dig things up. Yes. Did you call uh, President Thabo and Becky and say, look, we want, uh, we want you to use your influence so that a South African, a proudly South African company, can get this potentially very lucrative business deal? So just to give you back to the, uh, the question of how this started. So mm. Turkshell went and they were trying, they took MTN to court, yeah. trying to extract money out of MTN. They've tried on many occasions. They lost. They firstly took the, uh, the shareholders of MTN, the local Iranian shareholders, to court. In an arbitration, they lost that case. In the end, they went to the US. That case had to be withdrawn because there was no legal stand in terms of location for that particular case. There's another outcome that we are waiting for now which is the arbitration between the Iranians and the Turkish governments. We, are, we all keenly await that outcome. But what is significant about this case is that they relied on one witness 
only. And that witness is the story of this witness changed every time this particular witness had to give evidence. And what I'd urge you to do, as well as the public, is to go and read the, in the, the, the report of Lord Hoffman, which was the independent chairman appointed by the MTN board. And Lord Hoffman is one of the most respected jurists in the world. All he did, he took the evidence of everybody, nobody, he saw nobody, took everybody's evidence, he came to the conclusion and he wrote a scathing report on this single witness, confirming that this person is a liar, he imagined things, and he is reckless with the truth as well as with the lies. It does seem strange that Turkcell, which is a large international company, should base its whole case on one person. But let's not harp on this. You wanted to start your own business. That's what's uh, very That's interesting now. Are, Tell yes. me about Smile. Smile is amazing. Smile, I am so excited when I, when I talk about Smile because we started six years ago with the objective of bringing communication services to the masses in Africa at a cost that is affordable. Six years down the line, we are now the pioneers on the continent rolling out broadband access to whether it's individuals, households and homes, SMMEs, or in corporates, we are providing the first fourth generation LT broadband access services to four countries in Africa as we are sitting here today. How and that's it? significant. But how has a small company that's only six years old managed to compete with these giants who presumably are responsible for this type of infrastructure rollout? How have you challenged them? The, in terms of challenging, we, there's space for everyone in the market. And I always say competition is very good. Because when all these companies were operating six years ago, in 2009, we as SMILE were able to secure good licenses that would allow us to roll out infrastructure, as well as spectrum that would also allow us to bring broadband access to people. And those type of spectrum is now what we call is fourth generation. LTE, which stands for long-term evolution type of technology. Is it real 4G, though? This is for real. This is the type of technology when you get onto the internet, you are, you are going to experience speed, you're going to experience quality and reliability. You won't experience buffering. Even being in the studio, you can stream anything that you want without buffering. If I'm in Uganda, Tanzania, and the Democratic Republic of Congo, it doesn't mention South Africa. No, if you are in Tanzania, mm -hmm. Nigeria, in Ibadan, in, U in uh, Tanzania, Uganda, and uh, uh, Nigeria, yeah. Yeah. that's what you will experience. U Uganda, um, um, DRC, we will be there later this mm. year. But not South Africa. Not South Africa. We've been waiting six years, Lindsay. We're still waiting for the process to unfold and uh, where the regulator can be much more clearer you say about very, what they're going to do. Yeah, you say it very diplomatically and very politically correctly, uh, waiting for things to unfold, for the process to, to continue. I can't remember how you quite said it. But what you're saying is that there are layers of bureaucracy which are hampering your efforts. All I can say, if I compare South Africa, with the other countries where we have licenses, where we have commercial operations and where we have customers, that those countries, the regulatory environment, it's clear, they are transparent. Mm. There's a, the government encourage investment they are, and they are conducive to new entrants. That has been our experience in those countries. We're still waiting for South Africa. You're a South African, you're from Cape Town. Does it make you sad that you've had to say what you've just said? Are you proud because the continent is doing so well or has it is a, a sort of nascent revival going on in, in Africa, but the fact that we are actually falling behind countries like Uganda, Ghana, Rwanda, Tanzania, Kenya, etc.? It is sad that we have fallen behind because, um, you know, the fact that South Africa is also in the South, we are cornerstone for development of Africa and the fact that we have fallen behind because the regulator have not issued the spectrum to players like us or has created a conducive environment for new entrants to roll out and deliver 
fast and high-speed broadband access to the masses within the country. It is sad that we are falling behind and that we're not able to do that. I'm hoping, we've been hoping, we've been pushing, and hopefully it will happen. I don't, nobody knows even whether it's going to happen this year or next year. Mm. So uh, hopefully um, we can catch up with even countries like Uganda and Tanzania. How important is it for Africa in order to d develop economically to have 4G, 5G, LTE? I don't know too much about this sort of thing. I'm an ignoramus when it comes yeah. to it. But I do know that the access to internet comparable with countries like South Korea is vitally important to the development of the country and its people. You know, Lindsay, you've hit the nail on the head. In fact, I'll give you a very interesting uh, statistic about what the World Bank says about broadband penetration. It states very clearly, for every 10% penetration in broadband access in any country, it adds 1.38 percentage points to the GDP of the country. 1.38 percentage point to the GDP of the country with 10 percent broadband penetration. Which makes it all the more galling when, when, we, don't, when we don't roll it out and bureaucracy that, hampers us. That is the point. Mm. In fact, mass broadband is what will have the most impact in terms of the development of this content and content, continent. And this is why we are pushing it so hard this is why we are really, really passionate about bringing broadband access to everyone and also making sh trying to ensure that regulatory environments are such that it becomes conducive for players, including new players like us, and, con and creating a conducive environment to accelerate that uptake of broadband uh, um, access to the mass market. Just as we um, finish this now, I want to finish it <coughs> on, a, on a happy note, but unfortunately I'm going to have to go back to your union roots. What do you think of uh, Franz Bellany and the NUM and the leader of AMCU, whose name has briefly escaped to me? Do you look at these unions and say, you've lost focus? Yes, you're passionate about protecting the rights of your workers, but no, you're doing it wrong. I can only speak for people that I know. I know Franz Paleni. I've worked with Franz Paleni. He's a, one of the most hardworking, honest individuals that I know. Mm. And that's what I know of him. I don't know anything else the media say and what they do because I know this is an individual that has given his life for the union and the advancement of ordinary mine workers. He himself was a mine worker. So I can only speak for him. I don't know the It was unfair of, of me to talk about France. What yes. about the unions in general, very quickly? Do you think they're doing it incorrectly? The unions in general, I think they, they need to go back and understand why they are here. It's like with us in business. Mm. We have customers, and our customer experience are very important. They, sh they are there to serve workers. They should never forget that they are there to serve the needs and improve the lives of ordinary workers. That's mm. what